Hi, I'm Terry Cook. You're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs, and we have a very special episode this week. I am delighted to welcome to Hamilton uh, former Senator Hugh Siegel. Uh, Hugh, you have had a remarkable uh, career uh, in politics, in academia, as an advocate for universal basic income that we'll talk a little bit about today, and we are so tickled to have you in Hamilton both to do this show. I know you're doing a piece at McMaster University, and then tonight we're having a major event uh, with the Roundtable for Poverty Reduction and Hamilton Basic Income talking about really a centerpiece of your public life, which is campaigning for a universal basic income. So welcome. Welcome well, to Hamilton. Well, thank you. And I'm always happy to come to Hamilton because people who were heroes in my life uh, from a very young man, people like Ellen Fairclaw, people like uh, Lincoln Alexander, people like Sean O'Sullivan, who was a friend, uh, they always reflect for me the kind of spirit that Hamilton has always engendered, namely, uh, can do, uh, don't give up, keep up the fight, mm -hmm. and work for a better world. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you. And indeed, all of those figures were primary to my life in politics and public service. They shaped who I am. And uh, I was telling you before we went on air that, uh, that Ellen uh, had my grandfather's campaign manager, and wow. we visited her right until the end of her life. Sean was a mentor to me because he got elected at 20, I ran at 24, and wow. then Link Alexander, of course, is Hamilton's greatest citizen. Um, we're here to talk about basic income, yes. but now that you've taken me off course, yeah. in your book you talk about Ellen, who was the first female cabinet minister yes. in Canadian politics. In the Commonwealth. And Yes, indeed. And right. her role in changing immigration to make it colorblind. Yeah, when, Talk a little bit about when, that. When you hear various uh, people around the world, like Boris Johnson, yeah. uh, or even President Trump, say we want an immigration system like the Canadian system, mm -hmm. where people are assessed based on their health, their age, their education, their ability to uh, produce a family, depending on what their, what, their, what their general status is, their ability to find work, that, that is actually her system. Before mm -hmm. she was the Minister of Immigration for Canada, um, the immigration system was kind of who is your father mm -hmm. and where are you from and how many people do we want from that country or this country, uh, the kind of post-war period yep. from 45 to the late 50s. But when she became the minister in the 60s, she reformed immigration, so it went to a point system. And she basically took the whole issue of color and, and alleged racism and other issues out of the immigration system. And it wasn't perfect, but it was the most progressive approach. And it's still the approach, fundamentally, mm -hmm. that we use in this country so many years later. And she deserves immense credit for that. God bless her. And yeah. I was telling you that after her political tenure ended, she chaired the board at our Hamilton Community Foundation. And her family have a fund there that supports uh, the restoration and upkeep of church organs, which was a passion of her. Husbands. And without in any way being partisan, I can tell you that one of the joys of my life when I worked in Ottawa was that a lot of the young women in the Conservative Party <laughs> developed an organization called the Blue Circle Club. And they wore a little lapel pin and it was to, and, and they were called members of the Fairclough Committee. And long after she had passed, mm -hmm. this was about getting more women into politics and participating in our political life. And, uh, and that's also a, a tremendous tribute to her leadership and her courage. And a worthy... And decency, in innate indeed, decency. Indeed. So I want to talk about you and, and uh, your book, which I loved, uh, Bootstraps Need Boots, a, a Lonely Tories Fight to End Poverty in Canada. Um, you talk about growing up on the cheery edge of poverty in Montreal. And, and when I read your story, including the uh, uh, poignant uh, anecdote about your toy box, which right. I want you to talk about, right. didn't sound all that cheery, but it certainly seems to have informed your perspective on some of the public policy things you're concerned with. Well, Terry, when, when UBC Press came to me and said you should do a book and, uh, and it should be about the basic income, and, and I said, well, there are a whole bunch of great books out there and a mm -hmm. lot of arguments being made. Yep. And they said, no, no, we want, you to, we want you to answer this question. Most conservatives are not in favor of mm -hmm. a guaranteed annual income or a basic yep. income. What happened in your life to take you to another place? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and you, should, you should be forthcoming about those events and how they shape your understanding of how the world really works, mm -hmm. particularly for those who are disadvantaged. So, you know, I lived in a home... It was a relatively happy home because I had loving parents who cared deeply about all the 
three kids, my two brothers and myself, mm -hmm. but it was impoverished. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I remember um, uh, grocery products being sent over by the local congregation. Mm -hmm. I remember um, my dad, who was a cab driver, mm -hmm. on a Sunday night. This is before, uh, by the way, um, public health insurance, mm -hmm. right? So you'd have the bills from the doctor and the bills from the druggist and the bills from the grocery store and the butcher and the bills for the guy who provided the heat for the house and all the rest. And, you know, dad would say, pick any two because that's what we can pay right. this month. And, you know, you, you, you don't have to be a terribly sensitive kid to pick up that if there were tensions in the, in the, in the family, they're always about money. Right. And, uh, and, and there would have been a lot of people in Montreal who were far poorer than we were, who lived in much more difficult circumstances. We never lacked for food in the house and the home was always warm and all those good things. But I understood um, from a very young age uh, about A, there were people doing worse than we were, and B, that when you are in a family that is poor and doesn't have the resources necessary to, to send the kids on school trips, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure the kids have a warm new coat every couple of years because they grow out of the old one. Mm -hmm. Those simple things uh, actually begin to affect how you view the world and how the world views you. And, uh, and I thought telling that story would help people understand why this particular conservative is somebody who's very much in favor of a basic income. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that, that always struck me as fascinating is the wide range of people, both on the left and the right, who are in support of this kind of reform of our welfare system. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I say to people, you know, you know Richard Nixon was in favor of mm -hmm. this and he wasn't he a communist. No. I'm actually quoting a speech that Mr. Stanfield gave at the uh, Empire Club in Toronto in the, um, in the, in the spring of uh, 1969 before mm -hmm. a meeting not far from here in Niagara Falls, which was called Policy the... Policy Conference. That's right. And yep. it, was poli it was Priorities for Tomorrow, mm -hmm. it was called. Yeah. And uh, there was a paper coming from David McDonald. Mm -hmm. Uh, about a basic income yeah. uh, and it was going to produce a shootout at the meeting because often Tory meetings are always a Should wash. Should expand briefly on who David McDonald was. Yeah, so David McDonald was uh, a United Church minister mm -hmm. and he was the member of parliament, conservative member of parliament, progressive conservative member of parliament from Egmont, Prince Edward Island. Mm -hmm. And he had built his standing in the community because he reached across the floor to work with a Roman Catholic priest mm -hmm on local problems in PEI around poverty and alcoholism and family abuse and all those other issues, which was quite a radical thing to mm -hmm. do back in the mid 60s. Mm -hmm. And he got elected in 65, beating Jay Watson McNaught, who was <coughs> the liberal mm -hmm. uh, postmaster general of Canada at the time. And um, so he was a very progressive, uh, e engaged, humanitarian kind of member of parliament. If you remember the TV series, Quentin Durgan's MP, mm -hmm. he was kind of like that yep. in terms of his general disposition. And he was one of the people who I volunteered for and then uh, worked for as a research assistant when I, when I was at university and after I left university at the University of Ottawa. Yep. So Niagara Conference. Niagara Conference. So uh, there was this proposal which came forward. Mr. Stanfield was largely supportive of it uh, because what was clear then as it is now is that welfare wasn't working. Welfare was trapping people in poverty. Welfare discourages work. In fact, if you work and make a few extra bucks, you mm -hmm. get it clawed back yep. dollar for dollar, which is a very high rate of taxation. Yep. Um, and, uh, but, it, but the classic conservative debate was, I think it was Jack Horner mm -hmm. from Crowfoot, yep. uh, who said, this is communism. Yep. We can't be in favor of this. This is communism. So Mr. Stanfield, having to keep peace in the family, of course, which is always a conservative challenge, uh, asked... Um, the Honorable Jean Wads, who was an MP from Preston, mm -hmm. uh, Prescott rather, and she put together a, a re welfare reform committee which brought forward a series of recommendations which did not include, uh, include a guaranteed annual income. And I remember uh, Joyce Fairburn, who mm -hmm. was a journalist then, uh, wrote a piece for, the, for FP, the Winnipeg Free Press, where she said, Tories dodge the basic income and deal with lesser improvements. Yeah. So that was one of my, and I was there as a kid. I was at that conference. I was 19 years of age, a young conservative. And I, I saw right then and there that there is a kind of intrinsic opposition to this kind of fundamental change. And I asked myself, well, why don't we try to figure out whether this kind of change would actually be better than mm -hmm. what we're now doing? Because if you keep on doing 
what you always have done and our poor laws go back to the 1800s. It is in fact the definition of insanity. Right. And, it, and nothing gets better but you keep on doing it. Yes. The, uh, hoping for things to get better doesn't make much sense at all. Um, we're actually about two minutes from break but I want to back up further yeah. uh, because you're a working class kid in Montreal yeah. and the Prime Minister comes to speak at your elementary school. Yep. What did he say that inspired you to a life of public service? Well, he came in the middle of the 1962 general election campaign. Mm -hmm. Our riding was the riding of Mount Royal, which mm -hmm. was a liberal safe seat in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. It was the one that Mr. Trudeau took when he ran in 65. Yep. Uh, and so he didn't come to make a political speech. He didn't say vote for me or vote mm -hmm. for my candidates, although they were all with him, as you would imagine. Yep. He merely said that um, the purpose of politics is getting more and more of our members of the f larger Canadian family around the family table. We've got to make sure the farmers are there and the pensioners are there and the immigrants are there and the refugees are there and the people of low income and the people of all faiths and backgrounds. And I need your help to do that. He didn't say, I want you to vote for my party. Mm -hmm. I need your help to do that. And then he presented to the principal of my school a copy of the Canadian Bill of Rights, which of course he had brought into Parliament, was passed in 1960, and that was really the precursor of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in its early period. And uh, I was 12 years old and I was just blown away by this. He was a very effective speaker. Indeed. And when I got home for Friday night dinner, the fact that my father was a liberal and my grandfather was a, was a CCFer, a CCFer <laughs> made it even clearer that I was onto something and I had to hang in there. Perfect note. Um, we're going to go to a quick break, and then we're going to pick up on your journey into political life. I'm with Hugh Siegel, former senator and uh, champion of basic income. I'm Terry Cook. You're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Hi, you're watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. I'm Terry Cook, and I'm talking to Hugh Siegel uh, about his book, uh, Bootstraps Need Boots, A Lonely Tory's Fight to End Poverty in Canada. Um, I, I want to take you back because your entree into political life uh, happened really as a student. So Diefenbaker inspires you, uh, but you then get involved in student politics at the University of Ottawa and that prompts an engagement with the then Premier, well then the Education Minister of Ontario, Correct. William Grenville Davis. Tell me about that. Well the reason, this is, it's, it's, it's interesting how these names didn't mean much then but they mean a little bit more now. The president of the student government was Alan Rock. Indeed who was a very active federal liberal mm -hmm. at the time, yeah. didn't have much interest in provincial politics. Um, and I was the vice president of academic uh, elected in the student elections. And uh, the, Canadian, the Ontario Union of Students, as a matter of protest over some area of provincial policy, had withdrawn from all the consultative committees. Yep. And the Ontario Student Awards Program had an advisory committee. So that's the loans and grants that are given to Ontario students based on financial need. Yep. And they, ought, they had to have students on the advisory committee. So all the other universities were out. So um, uh, Mr. Davis's office called Alan Rock, who was the president mm -hmm. of the... Because we were not a member of the Ontario Union of Students. We had withdrawn mm -hmm. because we thought that the membership fees that we were putting into the OUS were not really being used to help students. were being used to, you know, talk about Mr. Castro and right. fight the war in Vietnam and all yeah. that stuff, which was not without merit, but it mm -hmm. wasn't what we thought student fees should be used for. Yeah. And so we were outside, so we were the only place they could go to get membership for this committee. And Alan Rock said, I'm not interested in going to Toronto for a provincial thing, but you're a Tory, why don't you go? Yeah. And I did. And so I remember um, flying to Toronto, mm -hmm. if you can imagine, from Ottawa. Um, the meetings were held at something then called the Lord Simcoe Hotel, mm -hmm. which is long gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would start at 9 in the morning, go to 4 in the afternoon, and often the minister of colleges and universities the Honorable William Grenville Davis would show up. Now let me, just to show you how different an era it was, um, they would serve um, steak mm -hmm. at lunch. Um, the minister would come in puffing on a cigar yep. indoors, which mm -hmm. you'd be up on charges today Indeed. if you tried to do that. Uh, but there'd be a very frank and open discussion. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed by two things. I was impressed by his very detailed grasp of how the college and, and university system operated. Mm -hmm. He was in the process of building the college system, the colleges of applied mm -hmm. arts and technology. And his view was everybody has the right to a post-secondary education. Yeah. 
and we should make sure we have the kind of education that everybody can participate in. Yeah. Irrespective of, of their abs background. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, OSAP was back then one of the most generous programs in the country in terms mm -hmm. of helping people from difficult financial yeah. circumstances yeah. to get to university. Yeah. And that's where I met him. And so when uh, a few years later uh, he ran for the leadership of the party, mm -hmm. uh, most of the people in my part of the province were supporting, I was in Ottawa, yeah. Bert Lawrence, yes. who was a local minister and a very And the decent, favorite at the time. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but I supported, uh, I supported Mr. Davis. Mm -hmm. I was youth for Davis. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the ways in which I got involved in provincial politics. Mm -hmm. And then after um, my time working on Mr. Stanfield's staff, after I ran for Parliament mm -hmm. in 72, and I came very close, but not close enough, in Ottawa Centre. Uh, and then I worked for Mr. Stanfield for a time in his office as legislative mm -hmm. assistant. And then that was the time, 72 to 74, when Mr. Trudeau, the father, was in minority government. Right. So uh, there had so I had some experience with the ups and downs of minority government. So when Mr. Davis got elected with a minority government mm -hmm. in '75, yep. the last one having been in 1943, mm -hmm. there was no one at Queens Park with any experience in the ups and downs and nuances of minority government. So I got asked to be Mr. Davis's legislative assistant. And so I joined his staff, which was one of the happiest moments in my life. Who were, who were the opposition leaders at the time? Uh, the opposition leaders at the time were Stephen Lewis yep. uh, for the NDP, who had yep. a surge in that campaign, yep. and Robert Nixon, okay. who's you know just down in Paris, Ontario, Indeed. and still alive and well, and yep. does a regular. I was blog. thinking it was Stuart Smith who actually. No, no, no. <laughs> Stuart uh, was wasn't until later. later. Right. Yeah, because no, no, he no. ran here in Hamilton. Yes, West. of course. Yes, right. and of course. I, I let me just to tell you. I remember when Stuart Smith competed for the nomination. Absolutely against Trudeau. And I remember when Stuart Smith was. Um, a broadcaster mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in Montreal yeah. uh, on CFCF with a program that was called Light Young, aimed at kids. I'll be darned. He and and the woman, he, the ultimately lovely woman, he finally married. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let me go back to your time with Mr. Davis because yes. that was where the intersection of politics and public policy around poverty first really, I think, became a central focus of your work, and that was around. Poverty among seniors in, in this province. Indeed, Talk I was about that I was sitting in my office as legislative assistant one morning, and I get a knock on the door about 11:30, and it's from the deputy minister for the social policy field, a very eminent gentleman by the name of Douglas Wright, who went mm -hmm. on to be the president of the University of Waterloo, yeah. and he said, "Hugh, um, they just did a committee vote, and they reduced my salary to a dollar, and the minister, the Honorable Margaret Birch, mm -hmm. first female minister mm -hmm. in Ontario history." Um, uh, to a dollar because we weren't doing enough about seniors' poverty. And I said, well, Doug, we just went through an election campaign mm -hmm. which was dominated by rent control mm -hmm. and issues around that, but there, were no, there was no discussion of seniors' poverty. It didn't come up in the debates or any. I said, why don't we, you know, first of all, your salary is not going to be reduced until that motion is approved by the legislature, so don't mm -hmm. lose any sleep about that. But more importantly, let's find out what they're talking about. This was a minority parliament, yep. so the NDP and the Liberals together had more votes than the Conservatives, mm -hmm. and they had brought in this motion and passed it, and theoretically could pass it when it came to the legislature as a whole. So the study was done. And a few weeks later, the study actually in told us that 35% of seniors in Ontario, who were largely women in mm -hmm. those days, we're living beneath the poverty line, and the stories that the stories that you saw in the Spectator and the Star mm -hmm. about uh, older women buying little bits of dog food and cat food in small tins so as to add protein to their diet were not apocryphal; they were right. actually true. Right. So this report went to cabinet, and I was as a hired help. I was allowed to sit in cabinet with my with my back against the wall with other aides and advisors, etc. And I figured this would be the classic Tory right and left. Mm -hmm. The usual suspects would be in favor of doing something. The other usual suspects would be opposed and they'd be saying things, well, the best social welfare program is a job and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. And, and of course, the Minister of Finance at the time, it was called Treasury Economics and Intergovernmental Affairs, was Darcy McHugh, the Duke of Chatham, mm -hmm. uh, the MPP. Still alive from, and kicking. Alive and kicking and doing well. And, uh, and he... You know, he was, he was of the center-right side yes. of the party, yeah. uh, always thoughtful, but nevertheless, strong mm -hmm. principles in that yeah. respect. And when it came to cabinet, uh, he basically said, these are the women who stood by and got us through the Depression. 
These are the women who waited for the men to come home from World War II. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be poor in my Ontario. Yeah. And he meant it. And that was the beginning of a piece of legislation which was brought into the legislature about four weeks later, supported by all parties, mm -hmm. because it had been started to be fair by the NDP yeah. and the Liberals to give them full credit. And that produced something called the Guaranteed Annual Income Supplement for mm -hmm. Seniors. GAINS, we called it. In those yeah. days, Ontario always gave every program a kind of simple name. Home Ownership right. Made Easy was yeah. called the Home Program right. and GAINS. And this basically said that when seniors filed their tax forms, if they were beneath a certain level, they'd get automatically topped up. Mm -hmm. And in a period of about three years, that program reduced the level of actual poverty from 35% among seniors to less than three. Yeah. And, you know, what, what do we think grandmothers and others did with that money? They didn't put it in some account no. in the Caymans. No, they spent it. They spent it back in the economy, providing yeah. local liquidity, or they helped their grandchildren, yeah. or they maybe moved to a slightly better apartment, right. or maybe they bought a new winter coat, and you be and they, or they had better food, which is more important. Yeah. You began to see the longevity improve. You began to see them living longer lives. You began yeah. to see real estate developers building communities for senior citizens because there was a community that was going to live long enough and be supple financially yeah. to be able to afford it. It was a huge step ahead. So we know how to do this. This mm -hmm. is not rocket science. So unfortunately, we're going to run out of time. But I'm going to gloss over your efforts with Mr. Mulroney sure. around poverty, a Senate report that you did on the margins. But fast forward uh, to more recent times when you helped to design the basic income pilot that was implemented here and in Lindsay and Thunder Bay that all the par parties supported initially mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. find out whether or not it would be successful and that the present provincial government unfortunately canceled. Correct. What should we take from the lessons of that experience and why is it that you continue to believe that that's the right public policy for the province and for the country? The most important lesson we should take and, and I think some leading academics right here at McMaster are, are going to be uh, sharing a study later today, today. Yeah which indicates that the same things that were found in the trial project in Dauphin, Manitoba, mm -hmm. namely that it, people were more encouraged to stay in the workforce, people felt better physically, they, they were in better mental shape, uh, the levels of food insecurity declined, mm -hmm. uh, their ability to engage with the community as a whole, their relationships with the rest of their family, all improved substantially as a result of the basic income. What we need now is the will to say, we know welfare isn't working, mm -hmm. we know it doesn't do the job, we know it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we try to find a better way to do this that is less stigmatizing, that connects people to the workforce, that, you know, in many cases, I think the study today will make it perfectly clear that a lot of people went on to get a bit more education because they had this extra top-up. They, uh, they bought better food. They spent more time with other members of their family. All the things we would like to see happen, better health status. Uh, and, and I think with today's, with today's study done by the great folks at McMaster, and the pilot was really about was getting the evidence for everybody to see. Not, and the pilot was shaped not as an advocacy document, but as a measurement document. Mm -hmm because it was going to be up against the control group, those who were getting the basic and the others, to see how their various statuses compared over a period of three years, which would have given solid evidence. And in Dauphin, what we found out was that uh, the expenditures of the Manitoba health insurance system went mm -hmm. down by almost 9% yeah. for the folks who were part of this proposition. And if you extrapolate that across Canada, that would save a very substantial amount of money that we are now spending because low-income people get sick sooner, go to hospital earlier, stay in hospital longer, and die substantially younger. And I don't recall a meeting of my party or any other party where we said poor people, poor people should die younger. Indeed. We think that's what our Canadian policy should be, but that's what our policy now is, unless we're prepared to make some fundamental changes. A perfect note to end on. And uh, Hugh Siegel? As always, uh, grateful for your wisdom, for your time here in Hamilton, and especially for your advocacy on behalf of basic income in this country. You are a great Canadian. It's been my honor to have you here today. Great privilege, Terry. Thank you. I'm Terry Cook. You've been watching Hamilton's Vital Signs. Please join us again next month. We're out of time. Take care. <laughs>